Hey everyone, welcome back to Channel Name. Today we're diving into some groundbreaking discoveries that shed light on the oldest origins of the biblical God, Yahweh. Prepare to be amazed because these revelations might challenge everything you thought you knew about ancient religions, the Bible, and even the roots of monotheism itself. So, make sure to stick around until the end to get the full story. First, here's the shocker, Yahweh likely began as a storm god, deeply connected to ancient Egypt and the surrounding regions. We're talking about a time when polytheism was the norm, when gods weren't just abstract beings, but powerful, localized forces controlling things like weather, war, and fertility. Yahweh was one of these gods, and get this, he wasn't even unique. He was part of a pantheon of gods, specifically tied to storms and warfare. That's right. Yahweh wasn't the all-powerful singular deity we often think of today. His early followers probably saw him as a warrior god, embodying the raw, chaotic power of nature's most destructive forces. Now, you might be wondering, how do we know this? Well, thanks to archaeological discoveries and ancient Egyptian texts, we've found mentions of a group of nomadic tribes known as the Shasu, who traveled across the deserts of the Levant and Egypt. And these Shasu worshipped a god named Yahu, or Yahweh, not as the only god, but as one god among many in their pantheon. Think about that for a moment. The god we now associate with the Bible might have started out as a regional storm deity worshipped by desert-dwelling nomads. But Yahweh's story doesn't stop there. His identity evolved rapidly. As the Shasu interacted with neighboring cultures, Yahweh's role shifted especially when he became associated with the Israelites. In the story of the Exodus, which many of us know, Yahweh is depicted as a fierce, unstoppable force raining down plagues, parting seas, commanding the elements. These are classic traits of a storm god, dominion over nature, the power to give life, and the power to take it. So, next time you think of Yahweh, Remember he wasn't always seen as the singular creator of the universe, but began as a storm god, a warrior of chaos, slowly transformed by the beliefs of those who followed him. Let's talk about Yahweh's incredible transformation from a storm god to the supreme deity of Israel. This shift didn't happen overnight. It was gradual, messy, and yes, heavily influenced by politics. Here's the intriguing part. Early Israelites didn't always worship Yahweh alone. They revered other gods too, like Baal and even Asherah, who in some texts is mentioned as Yahweh's consort. So, how did Yahweh go from being just one god among many to the ultimate, all-powerful deity? The answer lies in a pivotal historical moment, the rise of Israelite nationalism. As the Israelites began to set themselves apart from neighboring cultures, they needed something to unify them, a powerful symbol of identity and loyalty. Yahweh became that symbol, transforming into a national deity who embodied both political unity and religious devotion. This was about more than just faith. Yahweh's role as the god of storms and war evolved to become a force that defined Israelite identity itself. But don't overlook his storm god roots. You can still see them in early biblical texts, like the Psalms and parts of the Old Testament, where Yahweh is depicted as commanding the storms, riding the clouds, wielding thunder and lightning. This primal, powerful imagery didn't disappear. It was simply rebranded. So, there you have it. Yahweh, the God we now think of as the all-powerful creator, actually began as one God in a diverse pantheon, a fierce, storm-wielding warrior worshipped by desert nomads. The rise of monotheism wasn't instant. It was a calculated evolution, blending faith, power, and politics. And this is just the start of Yahweh's fascinating journey. We're just scratching the surface of the deep and complex origins of Yahweh. Now, let's dive into one of the most intriguing pieces of the story, the Shasu of Yahweh. This is where things get fascinating. Yahweh didn't start out as Israel's exclusive deity, and understanding his roots begins with a group of nomadic desert tribes called the Shasu, 
who roamed the deserts of the Levant and Sinai around the 14th to 12th centuries BC. So, who were the Shasu? Think of them as ancient Bedouins, wandering shepherds, moving across vast desert lands between Egypt and Canaan. Unlike the Egyptians or Mesopotamians, they didn't settle in cities or have centralized temples or powerful priesthoods. They lived in the harsh wilderness, constantly exposed to the brutal forces of nature. And in this environment, they needed a God who could protect and guide them through these extremes. Enter Yahweh. But here's the kicker. We have hard evidence that the Shasu worshipped Yahweh centuries before Israel even existed as a nation. Ancient Egyptian texts, particularly from the reign of Pharaoh Amenhotep, III mention a place called the Land of the Shasu of Yahweh. And where is this reference? Not in Israel, but in Egypt's borderlands. So, Yahweh wasn't originally an Israelite creation. He was a god worshipped by desert nomads long before Israel claimed him. And here's where it gets even more mind-blowing. The Shasu's Yahweh was no gentle, loving God. He was fierce, wild, a warrior deity, a god of the wilderness, perfectly suited to the chaotic, rugged world of his followers. This was a time and place where survival was anything but guaranteed. These people didn't live under the security of city laws or the comfort of temples. They lived in the raw wilderness, and they needed a God who could embody the strength and resilience they depended on every day. In a world of raw, untamed nature, with no armies or fortresses to protect you, the Shasu needed a God who could defend them from both natural and human threats. They carried this fierce image of Yahweh with them as they migrated, moving through Egypt, Sinai, and eventually into the lands that would become Israel. This is where Yahweh's transformation truly began, as his identity started to merge with that of the emerging Israelite tribes, who were in search of a national god to call their own. The Shasu, nomads without formal religious institutions, introduced Yahweh to the Israelites, sparking the rise of a once local desert deity into something much larger. Just imagine it, without the Shasu spreading Yahweh's worship across these regions, Yahweh might have remained a minor god, known only to a small group of desert wanderers. But because of the Shasu's migrations and their interactions with other cultures, Yahweh's influence grew, reaching a broader community. As the early Israelites struggled to survive in Canaan, they found in Yahweh the perfect warrior god, a protector who had already proven himself in the harsh desert lands. When the early Israelites encountered the Shasu and their worship of Yahweh, it wasn't merely a cultural exchange. It was a religious revolution. Yahweh was no longer just the God of the Shasu. He was becoming the God of Israel, transforming from a fierce desert deity into the central figure of monotheism. And this shift wasn't only about faith. It was about survival, politics, and the need for a unifying force. Here's the key point. Yahweh's rise to dominance in Israelite religion is directly linked to these desert tribes, the Shasu, who brought him out of the wilderness. But once he arrived in Israel, Yahweh didn't remain a regional god. His identity shifted, his influence grew, and soon enough, he was no longer one god. Among many, he was the god, the singular, all-encompassing deity. Let's take a moment to really appreciate how the exclusive deity we associate with monotheism today began as just a small group of nomads wandering the harsh deserts of Sinai, calling upon Yahowau to protect them. This isn't the sanitized, simplified version of the story we often hear. Yahweh's journey is wild, messy, and intricately tied to the people who needed him most the Shasu, whose fierce loyalty laid the groundwork for the rise of Israel's defining deity. Here's a thought that might surprise you. Ancient Israel was not originally monotheistic. Let that sink in. The early Israelites, much like their neighbors, were polytheists. They worshipped an entire pantheon of gods, including major figures like El, the chief god of Canaanite religion, often associated with creation, and Asherah, his powerful consort, a mother goddess in her own right. Then there was Baal, the storm god, who often found himself in rivalry with Yahweh, 
and Moloch, a god linked to child sacrifice. In those early days, Yahweh was just one deity among many, competing for attention and devotion. The Israelites had shrines and idols, and they didn't see anything wrong with worshiping multiple gods. In fact, there's strong evidence in the biblical texts that they believed in a divine council, a sort of heavenly court where Yahweh was just one of several gods. You can see this in passages like Psalm 82, where Yahweh stands in the assembly of gods, declaring judgment upon them. This wasn't mere metaphor. Early Israelites believed these gods were very real. But here's where things start to shift, the politics of religion. As Israel's identity began to solidify, especially during the time of the monarchies, the elites needed a way to unite the tribes and distinguish them from their neighbors. What better strategy than to elevate Yahweh above all the other gods? This wasn't about spiritual enlightenment. It was about national survival. The leaders of Israel wanted a single, unifying deity who could rally the people under one banner, and Yahweh, the warrior god inherited from the Shasu, was ready to rise to that challenge. Yahweh was the perfect candidate for this shift, but here's the twist, monotheism didn't emerge in a vacuum. It was a gradual process marked by resistance, rebellion, and conflict. The Bible is filled with stories of the Israelites constantly turning back to other gods. Take the golden calf in Exodus, for example, that wasn't just a random act of defiance. It reflected how deeply embedded polytheism was in Israelite culture. Even as Yahweh's dominance grew, people still felt drawn to other deities, particularly those associated with fertility, rain, and harvest essential elements for survival in the ancient world. And speaking of resistance, let's dive into some fascinating archaeological discoveries. For a significant period, Yahweh actually had a consort. Inscriptions from places like Kadesh in the Sinai Desert reveal that Yahweh was often worshipped alongside a powerful goddess, Astarte, who symbolized fertility and life. So, we're talking about a partnership Yahweh and his female counterpart, not just Yahweh alone. In fact, you can find references in the Bible to sacred poles or Asherah poles, which were likely symbols of her worship. Guess where these poles were set up? In the very temples dedicated to Yahweh. For a time, Yahweh wasn't the sole deity. He shared the spotlight. The push for exclusive worship of Yahweh really gained momentum during the reigns of kings like Hezekiah and Josiah, who implemented major religious reforms. Josiah, in particular, went on a crusade to eliminate all other forms of worship. He tore down the Asherah poles, smashed idols, and centralized worship at the Jerusalem temple, declaring that only Yahweh could be worshipped. This wasn't a gentle reform. It was a full-blown cultural revolution. But let's be clear, this wasn't just about piety. It was about political control. By eliminating other gods, the monarchy could consolidate power and unify the people under one religious system, one temple, and one God. Yet, it wasn't all smooth sailing. Even after these reforms, the allure of polytheism never completely faded. The prophets in the Bible spent a lot of time condemning the people for turning back to other gods. It was a constant struggle between the pull of the old ways and the push for monotheism. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and other prophets repeatedly condemned Israel for playing the harlots with Baal, Moloch, and other deities. This wasn't a minor issue. Polytheism was deeply ingrained in Israelite culture, and the shift to monotheism was an uphill battle. Now, let's dive into the real struggle that shaped the fate of monotheism, the epic showdown between Yahweh and Baal. If you think the Bible is just a collection of stories about faith and morality, think again. Beneath the surface, it's filled with cosmic battles between gods, and Yahweh's clash with Baal is front and center. This wasn't just a religious disagreement. It was a clash of titans that redefined Israelite identity, culture, and religion. Here's something many people overlook. Baal wasn't some insignificant minor god. He was a major player in the ancient Near East. The Canaanites revered Baal as their storm god. 
the one who brought rain, controlled fertility, and ensured their crops thrived in an agricultural society. He was, quite literally, the god of life itself, and his influence stretched far and wide, even among early Israelites. In fact, Baal was so popular that he was often viewed as Yahweh's direct rival. Baal and Yahweh weren't just competing for worship, they were vying for cosmic supremacy. In a world where there wasn't room for two storm gods, the tension between them boiled over. The Bible documents a full-scale battle between these two deities, and it wasn't just theological, it was a literal fight for dominance in the hearts and minds of the people. One of the clearest examples of this is the famous showdown on Mount Carmel in the book of 1 Kings. Picture this, Elijah. Yahweh's prophet stands alone against 450 prophets of Baal in an epic contest to determine whose God is truly the real deal. The challenge? Both sides prepare a sacrifice but won't light the fire. Instead, they call upon their gods to send down fire from the sky. This is Yahweh's moment to prove he's not just a local deity, but the one true God. But this wasn't just a showdown about fire. It was about Yahweh asserting his authority over the elements and proving that Baal, the so-called storm god, was powerless. As Baal's prophets shouted, danced, and even cut themselves in vain, nothing happened. Then Elijah stepped up, called upon Yahweh, and boom! Fire rained down from heaven, consuming the entire sacrifice. The crowd fell to their knees, proclaiming, Yahweh, he is God. This moment was more than a divine magic trick to wow the audience. It was Yahweh's declaration of war against Baal. For the Israelites, this event symbolized Yahweh's victory over the Canaanite gods and marked a turning point in their religious identity. But don't be fooled into thinking the fight ended there. This was an ongoing, brutal struggle that lasted for centuries, with the Israelites constantly wavering between Yahweh and Baal caught in the tension of their neighboring cultures. What's truly wild is that this wasn't merely a spiritual struggle. It was deeply political. The kings of Israel and Judah leveraged this religious conflict to consolidate their power. Some, like King Ahab, actively supported Baal worship, even going so far as to build altars and temples for him within Israel. Others, like King Josiah, made it their mission to eradicate Baal worship entirely. These weren't just personal beliefs. They were political maneuvers designed to either align with or separate from the surrounding Canaanite and Phoenician cultures, which were steeped in Baal worship. And let's not overlook Baal's crucial role in agricultural survival. In an ancient society where livelihood depended on rain and fertile land, people were naturally inclined to worship the God who promised those blessings. That's why Baal was so irresistible. Yahweh, originally seen as a war god, had to evolve into a deity capable of controlling rain, harvests, and fertility. He needed to become all-encompassing to defeat Baal at his own game. This helps explain why so many Israelites kept returning to Baal, even after monumental events like Mount Carmel. Baal was the god they turned to when they sought assurance for their crops and their very survival. Yahweh had to fight tooth and nail not just to claim spiritual superiority, but to prove he could handle every aspect of life from war to weather, from heaven to earth. It was as if he needed to expand his portfolio, so to speak. This cosmic battle between Yahweh and Baal wasn't merely a matter of theology, it was a struggle for control over reality itself. Through fiery demonstrations, wars, political upheavals, and relentless religious reforms, Yahweh finally emerged as the uncontested God of Israel. But this victory took centuries of conflict, cultural tension, and divine showdowns to achieve. Now, let's dive into the next crucial chapter of Yahweh's story, his transformation from a storm god of war into the covenant god of Israel. This shift isn't just theological, it's a complete rebranding of Yahweh's role, character, and relationship with the people. And make no mistake, this wasn't a natural or inevitable change. It was deliberate, driven by the needs of a nation struggling for survival and identity. At the start, 
Yahweh was this fierce, raw force controlling storms, leading Israel into battle, and smashing enemies. But as Israel evolved from a loose collection of tribes into a more established kingdom, Yahweh needed to evolve too. The people required more than just a warrior god. They needed a god of promises, a god of covenants, someone who embodied not just destruction, but also order, justice, and protection. Yahweh wasn't just out there wielding lightning. He had to become a deity who could forge a binding relationship with his people. This is where Yahweh transforms from a figure of fear into a figure of trust. The turning point, the covenants with Abraham, and later at Mount Sinai. In these pivotal moments, Yahweh makes a radical departure from his storm god persona. He's no longer just controlling the forces of nature. Now, he's controlling destiny itself. He binds himself to the fate of Israel in a way that no other god in the ancient world ever did. The ancient Near East was undergoing a seismic shift when Yahweh made a monumental promise to Abraham. His descendants would become a great nation. But this wasn't just a simple vow. It was Yahweh intertwining his own divine future with the survival and success of Israel. It was a bold move for a God who had previously been more focused on battling chaos than nurturing a nation. And don't be fooled into thinking this transition was peaceful. When Yahweh reveals himself as a covenant God, it comes with serious conditions, think laws, commandments, and a hefty demand for loyalty. This isn't a soft, loving deity just handing out blessings like candy. No, Yahweh lays down the law at Sinai, and it's intense. We're talking 613 commandments, not just 10, but hundreds of laws dictating everything from how to worship to how to live daily life. Welcome to Blessovia Science TV, where we take you on an exhilarating journey through the cosmos and unravel the mysteries of science. We are excited to offer you the opportunity to become a valued member of our ever-growing community of cosmic enthusiasts and knowledge seekers. Exclusive access to cosmic content. As a member of Blessovia Science TV, you will gain exclusive access to a treasure trove of cosmic content including documentaries, interviews with leading scientists, space missions updates, and awe-inspiring visualizations of the universe, live Q, and a sessions with experts. Your membership will grant you the chance to participate in live Q and a sessions with renowned scientists, astronomers, and space explorers. Get your burning questions answered by those who push the boundaries of human knowledge. Embark on a journey that spans the cosmos and join us in unraveling the secrets of the universe. Become a Blasovia Science TV member today, and together we will reach for the stars. Thanks for watching. Subscribe, like, and share. Don't forget to leave your comment.